Hey, do it at the end of class. If you already have, that's fine. Don't collect them up. But um, if you have not, we're going to turn those in when we leave and not right now. So, guys, what I want to do is I want to gather around this with you really quickly and chat. So, guys, you understand that we're in process, that you are learning what it means to be successful in this class, that this class doesn't feel like other classes, that this class doesn't function like other classes, that you actually had a teacher that got up before your, la your first unit test and said, don't worry about it. That in the same way that this is like a scrimmage and not the championship game, this is not some, you certainly it wants to feel real, but it's not real. Well, guys, you got to understand that the whole idea behind that is that we're headed somewhere, right? That, that each of these days is a progressive step towards May. Well, guys, in a similar fashion, this is also a step towards college. Um, and again, I mean, I love that letter that you guys all know it was Elise, right? That Elise wrote, Elise wrote about, about, man, as hard as this class was, dang it, you're helping me now that I'm a freshman in college. So guys, in that spirit, I've had a, a number of you come to me and say, I spent hours doing this chapter summary. I've had several of you come to me and said, I left some of the boxes blank. Are you going to fail me? Because we've got to come back to why we're doing what we're doing. And believe me, I understand. You have been trained for 12 years, kindergarten until now, that the way to be a successful student is by marching by the orders that your teachers lay out for you. And this feels weird when all of a sudden a teacher is going, we're doing something not to earn points, but one, to benefit you, and two, to help prepare you for your future. So guys, please remember, why do we do these? Why do we do chapter summaries? And importantly, why did we not do this one as an outline? And guys, the answer is because these are skills you've got to have to be successful down the road. Because the reality of it is, is you're going to get to college and guys, regardless of how good your professors are, many of them aren't good at all, you're going to have to learn from books. And so guys, I'm introducing you to these structures to try to give you some skills that you can use to learn from books. Um, I'm just going to close this blind a little more because I keep looking out the window. Um, so guys, understand that these chapter summaries are not for me, they're for you. And so when you get into the middle of these things, if you don't have any questions, don't write down any questions. If you think all the diagrams in that particular section aren't worth drawing, don't draw them. Because you're not trying to force something simply to fill up space. You're trying to make this into something that's valuable for you uh, with, the, uh, with the understanding that you're, you're trying to at least introduce yourself to the content out of the book. Now guys, understand again that in college, many times this is all you're going to get. So these, these things are going to be valuable tools for you down the road. But again, make it valuable for you. If you can get this done and do a good job in 20 minutes, do it. If it takes you an hour, do it. If it takes you a week, do it. But guys, you need to make sure these are valuable for you. I trust you, and you just need to take that step and make these valuable for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So here's the way this is going to go. Um, guys, um, I'm going to teach you seven of these. Um, we've done outlines. For this chapter, we did this four-quadrant system. We've got five more to go. That'll take us through Christmas. Um, I'm going to give you all of the ones that I learned in my academic pursuits in, in college and in grad school and elsewhere. Um, and then, guys, what's going to happen is at Christmas, um, you're still going to, after Christmas, you're still going to be doing chapter summaries, but I'm not going to specify the format. I'm going to leave it to you. Um, and I'm simply going to say, guys, we're going to do chapter 16. You pick the format. 
And so you are then going to pre-read chapter 16, get a sense of what it looks like, and then you're going to pick the format. You see what I'm saying? Cody, do you mind if I mention what happened to you last night? So um, I got up here in front of you guys, right? And I said, chapter 5, but don't do chapter 19. And Cody mushed both of those thoughts together in his brain. And 5 and 19 turned into 15. Was it 15? 9. You dropped the 1 and did 9. And so Cody outlined chapter 9. And it led to an interesting conversation because Cody's like, hey, so next time in class, we're going to start talking about bond angles and molecular structures. And I was like, no, we're not. And, uh, and, but then it was interesting because as I was talking with him about it, he was like, I thought something was wrong because there aren't any equations in chapter 9. Lots of diagrams, but there are no equations in chapter 9. Guys, that's the thought, that we're going to pick our chapter outline structures based upon the material. And you are going to be asked to pick ones that fit the material. So anyway, guys, all of that said, um, these are due today. Um, did anybody else do the wrong chapter? <laughs> Which one did you do? 19. You did 19 yeah. and 5? No, I just did 19. Oh, boy. So you're going to have to like take mental dental floss and like scrape all of chapter 19 out of your brain. Because um, seriously, I purposefully have you not do chapter 19. You'll be okay today. Do, fi do five by Wednesday. But seriously, Kenny, you're going to have to try to forget chapter 19 because the stuff that we're going to talk about in the next couple days is weird. And 19 makes it really weird. So pretend that never happened. Okay. All right. So guys, again, you're going to turn in chapter five when you're done or when we're done today. Good. Okay. So guys, grab something to take notes with, grab something to take notes on. And uh, let me explain to you how today is going to unfold. Uh Oh, there we go. All right. So guys, today is the 16th. If you're in the habit of dating your notes, keeping them organized, and guys, let me explain to you the purpose for today. Well, let me let you get settled. And actually, the best way to talk purpose is by asking you a question. Um, so let me ask the question. How many of you have taken physics at some level? Almost all of you. Okay. So guys, here's the deal. Depending on how well you connected with your physics classes, um, a lot of this is going to feel very familiar. Um, but what you're also going to find is this. When we get to the tail end of the material that we're going to talk about today, um, you're going to find that some of the things that we're going to talk about, if you really connected with physics, is not just going to sound different, it's going to sound wrong. And guys, you've got to be careful here. So guys, if you connected so well with physics that you understand the way the world works from the, from the lens of a physics standpoint, guys, you're going to find that a lot of this stuff relative to energy, physicists and chemists think of it differently. So if you're real tight tied to a physics standpoint, you're going to have to release that and grab a hold of a chemistry standpoint. And I'll help you make the transition, but you've got to get there. Otherwise, everything's going to be backwards. OK, so guys, with that said, here's what we're going to do today. We are going to talk, first of all, superficially about what thermochemistry is. Then, guys, we're going to do a dive into energy. We're going to talk about types of energy. We're going to talk about units of energy. We are going to talk about changing energy. We're going to talk about how we think about energy. And guys, what we're going to do is we're going to lay a foundation for everything that we're going to do in the next two chapters in this unit. And then for the rest of the year, guys, this is fundamental stuff that we are going to be using to inform everything that we're going to do for the rest of the year. So guys, it all relies on this. So this is going to feel secretarial, 
until it gets conceptually challenging. Because guys, you're just gonna be writing down stuff. Kinetic energy is energy of motion, blah, 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 blah. And then you're gonna go, oh crap, I don't know what kinetic energy is. So guys, please don't let the notes distract from your learning. So how are you going to know if you've learned today everything that you need to? And guys, the answer is this. The very last thing we're gonna do today is we're gonna muck around with this piece of brass. If you understand the conversation that we have that has to do with this chunk of brass, you're gonna be okay. But in as much as the brass conversation doesn't make sense to you, it means that you have gaps in your understanding. The homework will help address some of those. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk Wednesday. So, guys, with that said, here we go. So, thermochemistry, if we're going to study it, we should probably talk about it. So, guys, when we talk about thermochemistry, obviously we're talking about chemistry. But what does the thermo part mean? Heat. But broader than that, it means energy. So, guys, when we talk about thermochemistry, we're talking about the study of energy in the context of chemical reactions. Now guys, this is one of the places where we're going to draw on a lot of different backgrounds. Um, Alice had a different experience at Mountain View than Cody had at Tim, than you had, not that you had with Miss Call, because we do things together, but then even different backgrounds in physics. So guys, we all need to rally around this. If we are going to study energy changes in reactions, we need to figure out what energy is. So guys, for those of you that took chemistry from me or Ms. Call last year, this was brief, but we did it. Do you remember how we defined energy? Do you recall that? No? So let me just, let me help people. So guys, remember that day when we had the big triangle and it was matter and then it was hetero and homogeneous, remember that? And guys, in, in the midst of all of that, we talked and defined um, energy. I don't know if that brings it back well enough, but Mitt Rod Oh, no. Say it again. You're closer, but that's, that's actually the better definition. It's not the way we talked about it. Do you guys just not remember? Okay, so guys, it was this. Energy is the ability to make a change. And then do you remember we talked about physical changes? We talked about chemical changes. We went into lab, lit the popsicle sticks on fire, and evacuated the school. Yeah. Okay, that was the day. So guys, when we talked about energy a year ago, almost exactly today, a year ago, it was early mid-September, we talked about the idea that energy is the ability to make a change. If you're going to change something, that requires energy. But guys, understand that is not actually the definition of energy. Where did you get your definition? Probably from... Okay, so guys, while this is a good functional starting point, this is actually the working definition of energy. Guys, energy is defined as the ability to do work or transfer heat. Is that, that definition is complete. It's simple, but it's complete. So now guys, we've got to talk about attention. You may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, last year you told us that energy is the ability to make a change, and now you're telling us that energy is the ability to do work or transfer heat. Those don't see the same. Which one's right? Well, guys, it turns out they are the same. What's the connection? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Guys, that's it. If you are going to change something, the only way that you have to change something is you either do work on it or you transfer heat with it. Guys, it's really that simple. And that's the thing that makes thermochemistry weird is it is incredibly complex and yet its foundation is amazingly simple. 
And so guys, if you want to, I don't know how you want to connect these, but guys, fundamentally, there is only two ways that you can change something. You can either exchange heat with it, or you can do work on it or allow it to do work on you. But guys, fundamentally, the only thing, the only way things interact with, the only way things interact in our universe is an exchange of work or an exchange of heat. Do you get the idea? Because there's, it's obviously bigger than that. There's lots of ways to exchange heat. There's conduction and convection and radiation, all these different things that we don't need to get into. But at its most fundamental, guys, that's the exhaustive list. If you want to change something, it's either work or heat. You settled with that? Because I would encourage you to, in some way, make those two words, work and heat, jump off the page, because they're going to be very, very fundamental to what we do. Okay, so now guys, with this said, this is typically the point at which you guys start to know the answers to the questions. So guys, when we talk about energy, there's two different types of energy. What are they? Kinetic, kinetic and potential. All right. So guys, let's do kinetic first. Kinetic energy is, it's the energy of movement. Guys, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Who could it be? Oh, Josh. How are you, buddy? So, guys, I frankly don't remember if this equation is on the AP uh, equation sheet, but I'll give it to you anyway. Guys, this is actually one of the fundamental equations for kinetic energy. It simply says the kinetic energy that a substance possesses is equal to one half its mass times its velocity. And guys, this is important. Underneath mass, write down kilograms. And underneath velocity, write down meters per second. Those are the units that we will be using in order to calculate kinetic energies. The mass has got to be in kilograms and the velocity has got to be in meters per second. We'll talk more about why in a minute, but that's what you need to know about kinetic energy. You guys groovy on that? Go ahead. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to get into the derivation of it. You just need to know it. Okay. okay. But, Tucker, you will be interested to see in a moment, we're going to talk about the units for kinetic, for energy, and then you're going to see that the units for energy tie very neatly back into the equation. And we'll look at that in a minute. Okay. So, guys, if one of the types of energy is kinetic, the other type is potential. potential. Now, guys, this is where we need to draw a distinction. First, let's define it. Guys, this, this is big. You've got to understand the conversation that we are about to have. So guys, first of all, let's define it. What is potential energy? It's energy, stored energy. And how do we store energy? Position. So guys, this is the idea. Potential energy is stored energy. And then, guys, and you know what? Maybe we should add that. Let me add that because I, I skipped it because I just assumed everybody knew that. But it's an important idea to have along the way. So if you're not if you're not familiar with this idea, it is definitely worth including in your thoughts. So, guys, potential energy is stored energy, and then the question is how do we store energy? And the weird answer is positionally. So let's have a conversation relative to something that we can wrap our heads around, and then we'll have a similar conversation around something a little more abstract. So guys, we're going to pretend for now that Addie's desk is the ground because you can't really see the floor. So guys, we've got a metal block sitting on this table and we're going to say that her table is the floor so it can't fall off the table. So right now, does this block have potential energy? No. Doesn't. So in order for this block to have, and we're dealing on the macro scale, the block, does it have potential energy? And the answer is no. 
But I hold it up here, now this block does have potential energy that it didn't have before. What changed about the block that it now has potential energy? It's position. But guys, the question then becomes this, and you've got to make this connection at the macro scale before it'll make sense at the atomic micro scale. Guys, what about position gives that block energy here that it didn't have before? It's about forces and it's about gravity. So guys, you've got to make this additional step. And I don't know if you learned this in physics, but it's not just about position. It is about position relative to attraction. There is no such thing as gravitational potential energy if there's no gravity. So guys, as we talk about this idea of potential energy, to give us a frame of reference, we can talk about gravitational potential energy, which is potential energy depending upon mass position in the pull of gravity. So as you are trying to make sense of potential energy, guys, the idea here is you, you have a conceptual understanding of this idea because I think most of you understand that a block being held at arm's length has gravitational potential energy because of its position relative to ground because of the pull of gravity. Do we have that as a shared understanding? Okay. Because guys, if we do, then we're going to take this conversation in a direction that's way more abstract and more pertinent to what we do in this class. And for some of you, this is going to be frustrating. So guys, are we okay? Can we take the next step in this conversation? Okay, so guys, the next step in the conversation goes like this. We are not going to talk about gravitational potential energy in this class. That's a physics thing. In chemistry, we need to talk about another type of potential energy. So guys, you're sitting there right now in class. Your brain is burning energy as you're learning. Your body's burning energy as you're writing. Your heart is pumping. Your blood is flowing. There are so many processes going on inside of you that require energy. And then you get up and you leave class and you're going to run to lunch and you get in your car and you drive off to wherever you go to lunch and your car needs energy in order to move. And then you get back to school and you're gimpy and you need to get back to the third floor and you take your library card and you get in the elevator and it brings you back up to third floor and that takes energy. And guys, there's all these different places that we get energy. But let's talk about the energy that we need to fuel our bodies and the energy that we need to drive our cars. Where does that energy come from? Keep going. <laughs> you're so excited, you're speechless. Keep going. Tell us what you're thinking, Robbie. Yeah. COVID. Let, let's do this. Let's, let's just start with bonds. Okay. So guys, where do we get our energy? Food, right? We get our energy from food. So we're hungry. We, um, we know that we need energy in order to survive. So so we grab some food and guys, Inside this package of M&Ms, there's food. And we eat this food. And inside that food, there are molecules, fats and carbohydrates and sugars, which are carb. There are all these molecules inside of here. And guys, those magic little molecules contain energy that our bodies are amazing. Can I say create? Our bodies are very good at utilizing to get the energy that we need to do the things that we need to do. So the question is this, where is the energy stored inside these molecules? 
perhaps. It's it's and let's stop with that word. Guys, energy is stored in bonds. Okay? Energy is stored in bonds. Inside, and we're gonna have a bigger conversation, but let's build this idea. So, guys, energy is stored in the bonds that hold the molecules together. Is that kinetic energy or is that potential energy? That's potential energy. So guys, in our food, we have stored what is called chemical potential energy. We call this electrostatic potential energy. So guys, let me explain to you how this thought comes together. So here's what we've said. Energy is stored in bonds, and that energy is potential energy. But guys, we've already established what potential energy is. Energy is stored energy that is due to attraction and position. And guys, this, I, these ideas right here about what potential energy is has got to also apply to the energy that's stored in food. So where's the attraction and where's the position? In a molecule. Where's the attraction and where's the position? That's it. Guys, and that's why we call this electrostatic potential energy. Guys, all of the energy that is stored in molecules is stored in the attraction between charged things. So guys, check this out. Covalent bonds. I would write this down. Covalent bonds. Just brain dump with me. How do covalent bonds form? Stealing or sharing? Sharing, sharing of what? Electrons. So here we've got two electrons and they're being shared. But what do those electrons put together? Atoms. And what's in the middle of an atom? A nucleus. And what's the charge of the nucleus? Positive. So guys, here is our attraction. The nuclei are attracted to these shared pairs of electrons that creates attraction relative to position, and we now have the opportunity for potential energy. It's not gravitational, it's electrostatic. It's due to opposing charges, but it's still energy stored by position relative to attraction. Do you get the idea? Now, what if it's ionic? What if it's an ionic bond? Where's our attractions? Positive, not atoms, ions. We've got positive ions, we've got negative ions, and they're attracted to each other. I don't know how to draw attracted. That looks like repel. Oh, here, we can do this. And we've got ions that are attracted to each other. But Jason, you mentioned intermolecular forces. Guys, we can also store energy in IMFs. But if we store energy in IMFs, what are the positives and negatives that are attracting? Dipoles. For example, a water molecule attract, oh, that's not right. It's not the oxygens attracting each other. So a water molecule attracting another water molecule, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. So, yeah, so repulsion is also an electrostatic force, but what are you thinking about repulsion? So, there can also be repulsive forces, but repulsive forces do not allow us to store energy. Okay, is that enough of an answer? So, as it pertains to this conversation about, about potential energy, we need attraction, and we need position relative to that attraction to store energy. Does that make sense? Is that okay? Okay, so yeah. Yeah, 
Yes, absolutely. But you've got to be careful with the conversation um, because um, magnetism's not electrical, right? So there's electromagnetics and they're tightly related, but they're not the same. So you're right that if we've got if we've got magnets and if we hold them like this, so when they're like this, they have no potential energy because they're in contact. But if we separate them, we've now stored energy between these magnets based upon their magnetic fields and consequently they can close in on each other and we can get those to do work or exchange heat. Um, interestingly, similar to bonds, you get them far enough apart, the association breaks and we can no longer store energy in them. So they've got to come together in order to store energy. Is that okay? Uh, magnetic potential energy and we don't need to deal with it. Is that okay? Guys, is this sitting okay? Because I'm about to blow your minds. You guys okay? Okay, here's the thing that you've got to understand. And I'm going to do this simply at first and then we're going to let this get a little frustrating. Um, write this down with me. I'm not even going to balance it. Don't balance it. Doesn't matter. So, guys, this is, this is the conversation that we need to have. What does this reaction on the board represent? The combustion of what? Burner gas. So, guys, would we all agree that this burner gas contains an amazing amount of stored energy that we can then leverage to boil water, heat our homes, all the things that we, because this is just natural gas. It's the same stuff that heats your home unless you have electric baseboards. Same stuff. So can we all agree that there's a lot of energy stored in that? Is that okay? Where is the energy stored? In the bonds. Covalent bonds, CH4. Well, here, I'm going to even draw it underneath. You know what, guys? Maybe you should do this with me. CH4, O2, CO2. H2O, minus all the unbonded electrons. <clears throat> so now, guys, here's the important bit that you need to understand. We have said that CH4 contains an amazing amount of stored energy, and it does. But here's the place where you get into trouble. Guys, we start to create this mental image that says this. And it's horribly wrong. You're like, hey, methane molecule. All this energy stored in these magic attractions between the carbon and the hydrogen. And that's just teeming with energy. And all we have to do is break these bonds and the energy comes out, right? That's completely wrong. Guys, in order to break a bond, you do not get energy out. When you take a bond and break it, that does not release energy. You actually have to add energy to this molecule in order to get these bonds to break and to get methane to combust. So guys, this is the thing that's weird and you need to reconceptualize this. When we say that energy is stored in the molecule, the energy is actually stored in the potential for this molecule to make other molecules. Think about that. Guys, the potential that is stored in this molecule is not stored in the potential of these bonds. It's stored in the potential for this molecule to form bonds with other molecules. Here's the idea. In order for this reaction to take place, here's what's got to happen. We have got to first add enough energy to break all of these bonds. Do this with me. Guys, this is how this works. Alice, you said you understood this. This is Hess's law. So guys, it goes like this. In order for this reaction to happen, all of these bonds have got to break. But guys, the thing you've got to understand is that takes energy. In order to break these bonds, in order to get these to break apart, we've got to add energy to them. But then look at what happens. As soon as the energy goes in to break these bonds, 
then the hydrogens can grab a hold of the oxygens and form water, and the carbons can grab a hold of the oxygens and form carbon dioxides. Now we're forming new bonds. And as those bonds form, what happens to energy, in or out? Energy out. And guys, this is where all of the energy comes out that we think of as the heat of the flame. So guys, in the same way, and let me show you what I'm talking about. So guys, this block has energy, right? Block has energy because I'm holding it here. And if I drop it, the energy comes out, right? But in order to get that energy in, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to lift. I've got to separate. I've got to get them apart. So getting them apart means energy goes in, and it's when it falls that the energy comes back out. Well, guys, the same thing is going on here. That when we start with these molecules, they're all bonded together. This is a low energy state. And we've got to add energy to break these things apart. And then once we break them apart, they can then do things like hook up with carbon to make carbon dioxide. And that's when the energy comes out. So that potential energy is released, not in breaking them apart, but in the formation of bonds for the products. So you guys have all taken biology, right? And you guys remember, what is the energy currency in our cells? Do you remember? ATP. And you watch these biology videos where ATP, adenosine triphosphate, breaks one of those phosphate bonds, and one of those phosphate groups goes away and it becomes ADP. And in the video, there's a flash, and the bond breaks, and energy comes out. No, it doesn't. Guys, energy has to go in to break the bond between ATP to make it into ADP. Energy goes in. The energy is not released until that phosphate group turns into other stuff later down the road. But guys, to make the ATP turn into ADP, it actually takes in energy. It's not until the products are formed that the energy comes back out. Go ahead. Okay, make them easy. That's it. Yes. So there needs to be, well, and we're going to get way more into this, but in this case, yes, there needs to be an activation energy that provides that initial bump that gets the process going. Actually, Robbie, can I stop you for just a second? Let me finish that thought though. That doesn't necessarily have to be a striker. It could just be the kinetic energy that the molecules have. And sometimes these molecules will hit hard enough that they can break each other apart based solely on their kinetic energy. Okay. Keep going. Um, and also, like, about the gravitational energy. Assuming we don't have friction and yes, 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 yes. Um, and keep going. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so that's the idea is that, and we're going to give this a name later, a couple days, it's called exothermic. The idea is this, the bonds that are forming have a lower energy than the bonds that were broken. So we're going to draw diagrams that go like this. We take the reactants, the CH4 and the O2, and we add energy to them and they break apart. And we get a carbon, we get four hydrogens, we get two oxygens, this isn't balanced. But then those bond together and they make products and the energy that's released in the formation of those bonds is greater than the energy that's taken in in disrupting these bonds and therefore the net change is a release of energy. And again, Alice, that is Hess's law. So, so that's exactly the idea that the energy that is released is the potential of the energy in these bonds as compared to those. Okay. Is that, please. Yes. 
that's the next thing in the slides. Are you guys okay on this idea? Okay, so now guys, let's quantify energy. So now that we've got this idea, um, actually, you know what? No, here, get this in your notes. Just this, this is all what you wrote down, covalent, ionic, IMFs. Guys, you gotta get this though, because this is a term that you need to know. Total, total internal energy. So guys, by definition, total internal energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So all you need is this part down here. The term is total internal energy. <coughs> and it is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy a system contains. Okay, so guys, with can I get rid of that? Okay, so guys, with that said, Let's now start applying numbers to this. So guys, when we talk about energies, energies, the unit that we use to, to quantify energy in the same way that mass is measured in grams, the unit for energy is the joule. So Tucker, this is to your point. So what is a joule? And guys, if you wanna write this down, you can, but you'll never be held accountable for it. By definition, a joule is the amount of energy that a two kilogram mass possesses traveling one meter per second. So now you're like, wait, that's weird. Well, it's weird until you look at this equation and then you plug in the numbers. One half of two kilograms times one meter per second squared and when you run those numbers, what does it work out to? One, that's the point. So guys, just to put this in reference for you, how much stuff is two kilograms? Well, it's two liters of water. Picture a two liter soda bottle full of water, that's two kilograms. And if that two kilogram mass is moving at one meter per second, and if it runs into a wall and exchanges energy with that wall, it just transferred or had the potential to transfer one, one joule of energy. But that's really weird and doesn't make much sense. So guys, what you need to know is this, that a joule of energy is a very, very small amount of energy. So typically we will use kilojoules, which is thousands of joules. Write this down, but let me bring this to something you're more familiar with. Guys, here in the United States, we do not measure energy in joules. We actually do it in calories. Do you guys know that? You don't need to know this. But actually, you will for the lab. Maybe we should write it down. Guys, do you know the definition of a calorie? Are a calorie. It's the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So guys, it's the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water's temperature, one degree Celsius. What, are they the same thing? As what? No, and here's the relationship. So a calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. And that's exact, that's infinite significant digits. So guys, basically a, um, a, a joule is a fourth of a calorie to give you a sense of how small it is. But guys, this is where things get even more weird because I know that you're familiar with calories because you grab a Snickers bar and that's 250 calories. But guys, the thing that you've got to understand is that those calories are not these calories. Those are actually dietary calories, which are kilocalories. So guys, a dietary calorie, your 250 calorie Snickers bar, that's actually 250,000 little c chemistry calories. So guys, then the interesting question, and somebody asked this, how do we know? How do we know how much energy is in that Snickers bar? Do you guys know how they know? 
They actually do. They light it on fire. They take the Snickers bar and they dehydrate it and then they put it in a vessel that's charged with oxygen and they submerge it in a bucket of water. And then they light it on fire and the Snickers bar dust burns. And when it does, it releases energy into a known amount of water. And you can measure how much the temperature of the water goes up and work it backwards to figure out how much energy the Snickers bar had. Guess what we're gonna do in lab? That, okay. But guys, here's the thing that's interesting. Why the bag of M&Ms? And the answer is because these are from France. And it turns out that everywhere here but the US, they actually don't use calories, they use joules. So guys, this small bag of M&Ms actually contains 2,144 kilojoules of energy. In Europe, their energy units are actually kilojoules and they label their food in kilojoules. This is actually, they give you calories as well. But guys, over in, in Europe, they will actually many times label their food content for energy in kilojoules. But they are interchangeable, yeah. And that's the trick here, Robbie. The, the, the dietary calorie is actually a capital C calorie, which is understood to be a kilocalorie. Um, so they don't label it as kilocalorie. It's just a big C dietary calorie. Okay. You guys good on those ideas? Okay. So guys, now that we've done that, this is where your exposure to physics could become problematic. Guys, we've got to have another conversation and we've got to define things very carefully. So guys, let me set the background for you. Physics tends to be the study of big things. Balls flying through the air, trains moving down tracks, sound waves propagating through media. Guys, physics is the study of big stuff. And so in the mind of a physicist, the most effective way to study those things is to stand out here and watch them happen. Oh, look, there goes the ball. Or if you understand the Doppler effect, here comes the train. And you can think about the stretching and compression of wavelengths of sound. Red shifting as our universe continues to expand. Guys, in the context of physics, the best thing to do is stand on the outside and watch stuff happen. Now guys, understand in chemistry, it's exactly the opposite. So let's talk. In chemistry, just like in physics, guys, it's important that we define what is called system. Now, guys, here's the trick. This is going to be one of the hardest parts of this unit. Because many times you will not be told what is the system. You will have to pick your system. So what is a system? Guys, a system is the portion of the universe that you are singling out to study. But this is simple and yet tricky because guys, many times you can doom yourself to success or failure based simply upon your ability to intelligently define the system. And you get to pick, but once you've picked your system, everything else is the surroundings. Now guys, using these terms now, in physics, physicists love to be in the surroundings. My system is a ball, watch it fly through the air. My system is a train, watch it go down the tracks. But guys, the thing that you've got to understand is in chemistry, our frame of reference will always have you in the system. It's as if you're a physicist going, look at me flying in a ball, or look at me running down the track in a train, or watch me propagating through space as sound waves. Guys, in chemistry, we will necessarily put ourselves in the system. Why does that matter? It changes the sign of everything.
and we'll talk more about this later. But guys, you have got to understand that unlike in physics, in chemistry, you are not a passive observer. You are in the system. So guys, when we talk about this idea of system, there are some important things that you need to understand. First of all, this. In this class, all of our systems will be what are called closed systems. So what does that mean? Well, guys, in a closed system, two things are true. Energy can get out and matter can't. So guys, when we do chemistry in this class, we will always assume that our systems are closed, meaning that energy can get out, but matter can't. Are you guys caught up? Because we're about to segue. You okay? You guys are okay? Okay. So guys, let's talk. Here, what, let's do a so what first. Guys, matter cannot get out of a closed system. So what? What does that mean we will always adhere to? Law of conservation of mass. So guys, when we do thermochemistry, we will always assume that matter doesn't change adhering to the law of conservation of mass. But guys, this then becomes the accounting snafu in this unit. So we're never going to gain or lose matter. So that's always fixed. But guys, we are going to gain or lose energy. And this is all of the math of this unit is to figure out how much energy is moving around in which directions. So the question then becomes this, how does energy get in or out of a system? Heat or let's talk. Guys, that's the last thing we need to talk about today. Heat and work. And you'll notice from the subtitle, heat or work are the ways that we transfer energy. And guys, understand, this is not us dumbing this down because this is just a freshman college class. And when you get into your junior year, they're going to peel back the secrets and tell you all the other ways to move energy around. Guys, this is it. This is an exhaustive list. Let's just say it. There are only two ways to affect the internal energy of a system. It's heat and it's work, and that is it. Now, guys, you're not going to like this. Heat is abbreviated. <laughs> Ready? Work is abbreviated W. Heat is abbreviated Q. I know. It gets worse. Wait until... Whoa! Um, there is a form of charge, sort of. Kind of. Yeah, but we're not going to get into that. So guys, let's define these. First of all, let's define work. This is the work... Sorry. This is the definition that you need to know of work. Work, guys, by definition, is energy used to cause an object to move against a force. Wait, so let me turn in the chapter because we get that back, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, almost immediately. Yeah, yeah. Why do you care? Because I wrote that down See? Exactly. Yeah, that's why I get him back to you next day. Because, heaven forbid, something I ask you to do might actually have value. Huh? <laughs> I know. So guys, work by definition is energy used to cause an object to move against a force. So guys, let's talk about some simple examples. Well, actually, let's define this first. What is a force? A force is any push or pull that is exerted on an object. Some of you may know that forces cause acceleration. That's great, but you don't need to really know that. Block. Give me that back. So, guys, forgive me if this is offensive to any of you, but if you've driven to Salt Lake City lately, you know that that corridor has been under construction for like 17 years, right? And it never seems like it gets better. They always seem to be doing work, but nothing seems to be getting done. And many times what you see, forgive me, this is horrible, but 
Many times what you see is like 11 guys leaning on shovels, watching. Typically a guy with a backhoe scooping dirt. And you see this guy leaning on the shovel and you think to yourself, shouldn't they be working? The question is, are they working? If you are standing there leaning on a shovel, are you doing work? Well, let's talk. Guys, in order for work to be done, we've got to have two things. We've got to have a force moving something. We've got to have a force applied to something that's causing movement against resistance. So if you're leaning on a shovel, is there a force that is opposing your leaning? Yeah, it's, it's the shovel. You've got a force pushing back against you leaning. If you didn't, you would fall over. So you are exerting a force, and the shovel, interestingly enough, is pushing back. But are you doing work? You are not. Why? Because nothing's moving. Guys, in order for there to be work done, there has to be a force against resistance causing movement. Now, it's easy to think about the idea of movement not being present, but is it possible to remove the resisting force? And that's where things get tricky. Because, guys, even if I'm moving this block through space, is there a resisting force? Is there an opposing force as this block moves through space? There's air resistance. There's also inertia and all sorts of different things. So guys, it's hard to think about movement without work. We're not going to go there. But the thing that you do need to realize is that in order for work to be done, there has to be a force and resistance and movement. Does that make sense? Okay. Then guys, the other type of, of um, so work then is force times distance. Yes, and we're going to talk about that today and then never again. You'll see why. So then, guys, let's talk about heat. So, guys, what is heat? And the answer is this. Heat is energy. You know what? Let's, let's be a little more specific. So, guys, heat is kinetic energy transferred from hot to cold substances. And we're going to talk more about this later. So guys, let's at least give us a conceptual framework so we can wrap up the day. You guys all caught up? So question, how is hot water different from cold water? Moving, moving faster. Okay, now, so guys, you understand that, that right? That, that hot water, water is just molecules, molecules moving faster than cold water. How do we, how do we measure, measure the, the speed of the molecules? The thermometer, we call it temperature. We'll talk a lot about that later. But, guys, but guys you've got to understand, there's, there's really, really no such thing as cold. Cold, cold is actually, actually simply a frame of reference relative to something that's hotter. Guys, guys, energy always flows from hot to cold. Energy, energy never, never, never flows, flows from the hot. hot. The thought is that it's a hot thing and a 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 thing and therefore, energy always flows from hot to cold. You get the idea? Okay. So, guys, with that, we've talked about some important ideas. We talked about the idea of there being two types of energy. We've got kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. We've got potential energy, which is stored energy. And that stored energy, interestingly, is stored relative to position between things that are attracted to each other.
Then guys, after that, we talked about the idea that um, when we think about these ideas of, of energy, there's two ways, well, we should say this, that, that, that we then have this, this construct that is called total internal energy. And that is the sum of the potential and the kinetic energy of a system. Then we said this, we said that the internal energy of a system can only be changed in one of two ways. We can do work on that system or we can exchange heat with that system. Those are the only ways that we can change the energy of a system. And then guys, finally, we defined what system means. And a system is the part of the universe that we're studying. And the minute we define that, everything else becomes surroundings. Are we good? Then watch this. The floor, my table is now the floor. This block can't do that, okay? So, guys, this is as low as it can go. So we've got the block and we're going to say that that block is on the floor. So now let's define our system. Guys, that block is going to be our system. So if that block is our system, what is everything else? Surround. What am I? Surroundings, right? We're violating a little bit this rule that says we are always in the system. But guys, understand what that means because we're not... Look, there's a little shard of floor on my... I shouldn't have done that. Um, so, guys, what that means is this. When we say... Just a moment. When we say that we are in the system, what that means is we understand that really we're in the surroundings. But our frame of reference, and I'll explain this more in a minute, our frame of reference is always as if we're living in the system. So there and that's our point of view. So this is our system. I am in the surroundings, but my point of, of reference as is, is as if I'm inside the block. Go ahead. Okay, so if it, it, ignore that it, it's on the ground, but it's on the table. So say it's actually on the table. It is. Good, good. Let's come back to that in a second because, but okay, let's do it now. So here's the idea. We understand that this thing can actually fall, yeah. right? So because it can actually fall, it does have potential energy. Would it be less than if it was being pulled up? No, it would be exactly the same. Whether it's like this or if it's like, assuming I can hold it at the same level, it's exactly the same because the potential energy of this block is only dependent upon its mass, its altitude, and the force of gravity. That's it. So if it's there or if it's there, it's the same. But we're going to put it here, and we're going to call this the ground so that becomes zero. Go ahead. Slightly, because gravity is stronger. Take that to the extreme. Imagine that we held this block at arm's length here, and then if we held this block at the arm's length on the moon, does it have the same potential energy? Why not? Gravity is different. So gravity actually does change without, have I told you this story? So my senior year in high school in physics, we had to do an honors project. And my honors project was actually to measure the change in gravity based upon altitude. So I built a pendulum, and the period of a pendulum is dependent upon the strength of gravity. So I timed this pendulum over like an hour of swinging and figured out the pull of gravity. Then I climbed up to about 13,000 feet on top of this mountain with my pendulum and did it again. And I was able to measure how much less gravity was up there based upon the period of the pendulum. Yeah. But they still have potential energy sitting on the ground? No. No, and here's why. It can't fall. There's nowhere for this to fall. I mean, and, and that's the point. We have to define ground because ultimately the only place this has no potential energy is the center of the earth. That if we dug a well, it would fall down the well. So we have to define zero. Okay. So guys, watch this. We are going to agree is ground. Now I get to ask the questions. Does that block have potential energy? It does not, because we're saying this is the ground. Now, guys, importantly, follow this. Does that block have kinetic energy? No. It depends. 
Because, guys, we understand that these molecules, these atoms inside here are vibrating, and that vibration is kinetic energy, and the only way to get that to stop is to push it to absolute zero. But for this conversation, we are not going to talk about the kinetic energy of the atoms. We are going to talk about the kinetic energy at the macro scale of the block. So is the block moving? Therefore, does it have kinetic energy? Okay, so right now, what is the total internal energy of that block? Zero, are we agreed? Okay, now watch. So now guys, imagine that we want to change the energy of that block, ready? Has it changed? Why? Uh, so in order, for, in order for the energy of that block to change, the surroundings have got to act on the block. The energy of a system cannot change without interaction with the surroundings. The implications of that on the Big Bang are mind boggling, but we're going to keep going. Now, so guys, the idea is this. So this block cannot on its own change itself. So what do you say me and the surroundings come along and I'm going to change the energy of this block. Ready? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some energy to the block. Now, guys, I've only got two choices, right? What can I do to change the energy of this block? I can heat it up or I can move it. I can do work. Here we go. I am now moving the block. Does this qualify as work? What are the three things? We've got to have movement. We've got to have resistance. What's the resistance? And we've got to have a force that's working against the resistance. And we do, and I'm lifting this block up, and I'm going to stop there. Now, does this block now have internal energy that it didn't have before? It does. Now, here's the question. How much internal energy does this block now have? The same amount of energy that I expended in getting it there. Does that make sense? We're going to talk more about the law of conservation of energy in the coming days. But guys, the energy that I put into this block is being absorbed and it is being, it's changing the internal energy of the block. So now the amount of energy that I burned is equal to the amount of energy this block now has. Okay, so now this block has potential energy. And let's give it a number. Let's say 100 joules. So now this block has 100 joules of energy that it didn't have before. Agreed? Now, is that energy kinetic or potential? Potential. I'm shaking. But if this block were not moving, that would be potential energy. So right here, what is its potential energy? 100. What is its kinetic energy? Zero. So guys, kinetic plus potential is called what? Total internal energy. And its total internal energy is 100. And then guys, when I let go of this, as I let, when I let go of this, what happens to its potential energy? It decreases because its altitude is changing. Where is that potential energy going? kinetic energy because its velocity is changing. So guys, as this block drops, assuming there's no air friction, as this block drops, what happens to potential energy? What happens to kinetic energy? What do you suppose happens to the total internal energy? The same. Why is that? Because if there's no air friction, this block cannot get energy into the surroundings because there's no chance for it to do work or transfer heat. Do you get it? Okay, so as the block falls, potential is becoming kinetic until zero. So it has no, what is its kinetic energy? A hundred. So it goes potential becoming kinetic, potential becoming kinetic. Before it hits the tabletop, all of its potential has been converted to kinetic and then boom. now what is its total internal energy? Back to zero. Where did the energy go? Into the surroundings. But how did the energy get into the surroundings? Work and heat. So guys, where is the heat? It actually heated up the table. Guys, when these things hit, heat is transferred into the table. The molecules in the table move more quickly, and it did actually heat the table. But most of the energy was not lost as heat. It was lost as work. Remember, guys, work is force against resistance causing movement. What was moved? 
the air. Guys, when this thing hits, it moves the air. And as it moves the air, wait a minute, as it moves the air, this energy propagates and then it wiggles our eardrums and we experience that as sound. Do you get the idea? So guys, here then is what we know. And you can read it in the notes. But guys, it goes like this. These are the things that we've got to agree on. That energy can be converted from one form or the other, kinetic potential, total internal energy doesn't change. The only way to get energy in and out is work and heat. Here is your homework. We'll see you Wednesday. Now you understand why I don't teach physics. It's exhausting.